Welcome everyone to Westcliff University's Distinguished Innovator Speaker Series. And our next speaker in our fall series, Celine Eichler. You know, we're always looking for interesting entrepreneurs and interesting companies. Um, Celine brings us both. She's an interesting person with a, a fantastic history, story, and a fantastic company, which we'll get into, a unique company. I'm Dr. Barry Sandro, Director of Entrepreneurship at Westcliff University and your moderator. Uh, I'm really happy you're able to join us this morning. We'll get into to, uh, Celine's story in just a moment. But first, I want to briefly introduce Westcliff University to those in the webinar audience who might not be familiar with the institution. Pictured here is our campus in Irvine, California. Westcliff is an accredited private institution of higher learning with close to 5,000 students in, enrolled both live, online, and on campus. There are four colleges, College of Business, College of Education, College of Law, College of Technology and Engineering, and we just started the College of Nursing. And we also offer a full stack coding bootcamp and a cybersecurity bootcamp, both are certificates. To learn more about Westcliff, including our awesome undergraduate athletic program, I invite you to visit our webinar, our website at westcliff.edu, as well as Westcliff University on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn, just about everywhere. I want to get into uh, introducing Celine. I give a, 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 a workshop on the entrepreneurial uh, mindset uh, to several hundred students during the year. And I talk about the heads and tails of entrepreneurship. The heads is what we normally see uh, when we look at a, an entrepreneur like Steve Jobs or, or, or Elon Musk, all of the, you know, the wealth trappings, uh, all of the good stuff, but we don't see the tails. And the tails are very significant. And uh, in that workshop, I provide both the heads and the tails. And I show the, the, the stress and all of the difficulties associated with starting a company. And I present that to the students with these th three icons, uh, basically Jobs, Elon Musk, and uh, Marty Cooper invented the cell phone. And while they can relate to it, um, it's difficult, obviously, because uh, those people are bigger than life. But what I try to present is the fact that they all have one thing in common. They have the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur. They have passion. They've mastered self-discipline. They're unafraid of risk-taking. They understand creative associative thinking. And they have persistence and resiliency. It's ingrained. They never give up. And at the end of that workshop, I present Celine. And I talk about how Celine basically has all of those characteristics. Uh, and what she's done is created a unique product and a unique business that has a, a cult-like following, but also a health following and, uh, and basically, it also resonates with people who are concerned about the environment. It's called Karma Baker. She turned a passion, a hobby really, into a company that has a national footprint. And we're gonna get into how she did that very shortly, but let me give you a little background on Celine. Uh, Celine and I have known each other for several decades. Uh, in fact, I gave her her first job. Um, it was at uh, yeah. American Film Technologies. She had a design uh, background. She actually went to school for design. And then she came to American Film Technologies for a job. I gave her one. And the very first thing she worked on was a groundbreaking feature film uh, called Where Back a Dinosaur Story. And this was a precursor to Jurassic Park. It was the very first animated feature film that was not shot on film. It was all digital, 
which was very, very unique. And like I said, it was groundbreaking. It was just before uh, uh, Jurassic Park happened. Then she went on to Chicago where she worked for an ad agency and she took everything she learned from working on We're Back a Dinosaur Story and she created a digital uh, pipeline for this uh, ad agency that was doing everything traditionally. After that, she went to Klasky Supo. Um, so Celine, uh, you, you had this, this great animation uh, uh, career started. Let's talk about where you went from there. Yeah, so, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, so yes, had a, an amazing career in animation. Um, I always imagined I would get right back into it. I um, had my first child, went back and did another movie. After the second one, I thought, you know, I just want to take a little more time off and be home with, with her while she's a baby baby, because the first one went by too fast. Um, and then I thought, well, just, you know, get right back into my career after that. And I ended up really liking being home with my kids and seeing how much they needed me. And a year turned into a couple of years and I ended up just being a stay-at-home mom and really like loving it and feeling a lot of purpose in it. And it was a job that I took very seriously, like all my jobs, but I didn't realize I would like it so much. So um, yeah, being home with my kids was very important. And that was the, that was where I went after that. Right. And, and in the middle of that, you also uh, had the, the problem of you, you had a divorce. Yes. And you had yes. to go out and earn a living. And yes. you knew that animation was an 18 hour a day job. Yeah. No exactly. Way around that. exactly. I thought, you know, when, when the divorce happened and I thought I do need to get, you know, back into something. Um, and I also lived a little further away and getting back into animation, even though I could get into it. I had lots of ties. Um, it, it was too much, too encompassing. And my kids were still young and they still needed my presence. And I needed to be there for them in some sort of flexible manner. So I needed to take them to school and pick them up and have a job that would give me flexibility. So um, I thought, you know, I'll just make my own job. <laughs> right. I, I'm going to say from the get-go, I was naive in every avenue of creating this business and creating what I did um, and why I did it. You know, I, I think I genuinely, you know, I wanted to do something creative and I wanted to have flexible hours and be home with my kids. Those were kind of my parameters. I also, though, had been, you know, baking for my next door neighbor's daughter. Um, she's highly, highly allergic to like dozens and dozens of foods, all the basics, you know, wheat, eggs, dairy, nuts, some fruit, vegetables, like crazy things, you know, tuna, like an anaphylactic allergic. So she could not even, not a, not a grain of wheat could be around, you know, super, super sensitive. So I had taken on to myself, you know, it's making brownies for my own kids. I can figure out something for her. So in my creative mind, in my like, you know, um, self-importance. I'm like, I can figure that out. That can't be that hard. Well, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to bake without wheat or eggs or dairy, um, especially back then when there were just, nobody was doing that. It was, it was a very rare thing to have an allergy and to not eat those things. There weren't even a lot of vegans then, you know. So um, I took it upon myself to start baking for her. I got really good at it. My neighbors, my friends were just floored. They couldn't believe what they were eating it was so moist and tender and just not on the market. It was not available. Um, and at the time that it was, that I was making these strides at home with kind of no direction other than, you know, I'm going to give Sophia something good to eat. You know, I'm going to bake something good for myself. I had also found out that my my runny nose every time I ate was actually a food allergy. Sophia's mom, Maria, was like, yeah, you need to check that. Um, so I got tested and found out I also have wheat, dairy, eggs, all cow, all bovine, um, beans, garlic, weird foods. But I thought, you know, I'll just get rid of them and maybe I'll get them back, you know. 
but that's when I really upped my game at the baking. That's when I really got good. That's when I decided this cookie can't just be like, okay, for kids, it needs to be like amazing for anyone because I'm going to eat it and I don't like to waste calories. <laughs> so I was making chocolate chip cookies that melted in your mouth that were blowing people's minds. And all my people around me were like, start a baking. You need to share this, do something with it, you know? But I didn't want a business that, you know, I didn't want a bakery. I didn't want to be open every morning at 7 a.m. and serving coffee. And, you know, I, that wasn't what you know, I was doing this for, I was doing this because something, I created something that no one had had, that no one had access to, and that people truly needed, because I had a strong drive, desire, um, like a pull to, to feed, to make something good, to, you know, People use food to celebrate, you know, and a lot of the things I was seeing in my circle with Sophia and her mom, it was not celebrating going on. There was like, they would see her awful cake and the, the kids at the party would like pull away, <laughs> like I'm not eating that. And the, the, you know, the, the toll that took on little Sophia's heart, you know, it made her afraid of food, it made her afraid and feel so left out and it really like created such a divide. I couldn't handle seeing it, you know? And so I thought I can figure out something good. You know, I can figure out something, something great that all these other kids are gonna want and Sophia can have too. And that is kind of the impetus for, if there's a Sophia here, then there's hundreds elsewhere and they need this in their life in order to feel included, you know, to not feel excluded. Yeah. As well as people like yourself who have allergies they weren't even aware of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And nowadays, you know, that was almost 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, nowadays, it's far more common for people to recognize, you know, oh, my body isn't like everyone else's body. Yeah. It's, it can't have this or that. Or I'm going to give it a break from this or that food. You know, I'm going um, I'm to take care of myself. So. I think a lot more people are realizing that the food that they eat has a much, much bigger impact on their health and their well-being than doctors will even say, you know. So. And you started out as a cottage, basically you got a cottage industry license, right? Yeah. So because I didn't want a storefront, I thought, you know, I just want to sell to businesses. I'm going to sell to local um, local restaurants, to cafes, you know, cookies and donuts and things that cafes can sell with their coffee. Um, ultimately, I want to be, you know, the Starbucks bakery. I go into Starbucks, I can't eat anything in there, you know, and they have tons and tons of food. That's half their business. So that I'm going to make something that's good enough for Starbucks, you know, and that's, that's an entrepreneur talking. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it better than anyone else. <laughs> That is some kind of... Well, I've, I've heard you say, I don't want to be the uh, karma baker in Los Angeles. I want to be the karma baker of the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did not want to start a little bakery. I wanted to feed the world. Yeah. yeah. So high, high hopes. Um, you know, and I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say, like, that was my thinking when I started. Whether that was naive or not, you know, that's where I came from. Like, I'm going to make a change. I'm not just going to, you know, dig here in the, in the sand. I'm going to do something big, you know, way out there ahead of me. And it's, it's a long road. I don't even know what it looks like, but that's the goal. You know, it's like, I, I always imagine it's like a mountaintop is the goal. And even though I'm here and I'm going to walk to that mountain, I always see it. I, everything I do and think about and focus on in a day has to do with how do I get to that mountaintop, you know, and that road is wiggly. <laughs> it's wiggly, it's uphill, sometimes it's downhill, but you don't look down at your feet, you look at the mountain that you're headed to. So that's how I kept my focus all this time is, you know, staying with it. But it, it, this happened organically. Oh, you, I think you, you went to a restaurant or something like that, you, and they bought some, and then another one bought, correct? Yeah. So I started out in my kitchen. I got a cottage license. It was January of 2013, and they were giving their first ones out. I said, that's perfect. 
started baking at home, went into a few restaurants locally and they were like, yeah, we have nothing. This would be amazing. So in six months, I had completely outgrown my home kitchen, like completely. It, I could not keep up. My oven was just not big enough. Fridges and freezers weren't holding anything. Um, so I went out and found a commercial kitchen for a woman who actually um, did wedding cakes. So she only needed the kitchen on like Friday and Saturday, Thursday, Friday. And I had the kitchen the rest of the time. So I was in there Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I started outgrowing her kitchen. <laughs> I was asking her for more time. Um, and then a fun thing happened. She said, you know, I'm going to sell this. And I said, I will buy it. I will totally buy this. And she said, oh, I promised it to my friend. And I thought, well, I'll give you even more money. You know, like I was this about it, you know, really focused. And, and she wouldn't take the money. And I, I was beside myself because I could not find another commercial kitchen. I could not find a current bakery. I didn't have the money to spend $100,000 on equipment to, you know, build out a new space. Um, and so one day I went for a drive and I just said, send me to the bakery. Just send me. I just trusted in the universe and I kind of asked the angels around me, do your deed. And I heard in my ear, go get your nails done. <laughs> like, okay, I guess the universe needs a little minute to think about. It. <laughs> but I did. I went to my local nail salon and then instead of pulling in, I heard, keep driving. And so I kept on driving. And at the other side of the mall, there was a retail space that, um, yeah, as I remember, was like a cookie shop or something. Um, it said, call the realtor. I called him. He met me in 10 minutes. Miracle in itself, let me tell you. A sign from the gods that it was going in the right direction. And when we walked in, he said, now, everything in here is included, so you have to manage it. Everything in there included $100,000 in equipment, like everything. So ovens, racks, baking pans, like everything. I took it in the minute that he offered it. Um, and it also had a storefront, which I was dead set against. But in feeding the nation, as I had planned, you have to first feed your community, I guess. And uh, the community started knocking on the door. They said, when are you gonna open? We can't believe you're here. Oh my gosh, it's so incredible. We need this here. And um, so one day I just put an open sign in the front door. I did not plan to have a storefront. I did not have a menu set, but the demand was there. People were asking. And so I just pivoted and moved in the direction that I didn't even want to go in, but I felt was the right way. So opened the storefront and, and yeah, we did a thousand dollars our first day. Like it was just, you know, it was like a wheel was rolling downhill and I was just hanging on. <laughs> Here we go, you know. It's real karma. Yeah, organic. Yeah, real karma. So uh, how did you get to the point where you started shipping? So we got a website pretty quickly. Um, I wanted people to be able to order online and pick up in the store. So we started with that. Um, we had very few items that could ship because I didn't want products to go you know, across the country and take too long, get their stale, get their dry, not be pretty. Um, you know, dessert and food is important in many aspects, all those, all those presentation aspects. But also we we're changing people's minds about their food and that bite that they take is everything. It is crucial. They've already decided, oh, it's probably not gonna be good or how good could this be? You know, it's missing all the things, you know. So always from the get-go, everything that everybody puts in their mouth, that first bite has got to be stellar. Like it, they've got to go, whoa, this is really good. And that's happened thousands and thousands of times. But for shipping, you have many more aspects going against you. So we only shipped a handful of items. We started the website, we put some stuff up there, kind of just waited, continued along with our grocery stores, our cafes, our storefront. Um, and sales were small, small for a long time, but it gave us the time to learn what to ship, how to ship. Um, you know, now we're shipping whole, whole birthday cakes and they must arrive. Be a, at must perfect. be a huge amount of R and D that went into this. 
exactly. So much R&D, years and years. I mean, just cakes alone, we spent a year shipping cakes, you know, where, where a lot of them didn't end up very well. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of cakes. And I have to say, you, you make everything from scratch. I mean, even graham crackers, you create the graham crackers for yeah. everything. Part of being a pioneer is, um, you know, you have to do a lot of stuff on your own. Uh, most commercial bakeries right now, you know, they buy all of their stuff. They can buy an eclair ready to go and they just fill it with cream that they buy in a bucket and then they put some frosting on top that they also buy. You know, we have to make our own, our own caramel, our own sprinkles in the early days. Um, all of the pieces that go into making our product because it is gluten-free, because it is dairy-free and egg-free, because we use organic ingredients, you know, our customers are wanting a superior product. They pay for it. They well, that, that, that gets me to something I wanted I wanted you to present, and that is what is the difference between a regular bakery and your particular vegan bakery? Yeah, so that that is it right there. Um, we do have to do everything ourselves. So the main thing when it comes to two bakeries, our product is much higher quality, ingredients are much more expensive. Um, the outcome of the product itself is much more expensive and it lends itself to, to people who need it or who really care about what they're doing. Um, the difference between a regular bakery is all their ingredients are subsidized by the government. Wheat, eggs, dairy, their ingredients are practically free. Our ingredients are like three to four times more expensive and almost impossible to find. Like we don't have any competition in that field yet. You know, the vegan market is just getting going where, you know, if you don't want to pay as much for your certain kind of cream or butter, there's 20 different brands to choose from. You know, we don't have that luxury. We have one company that makes our organic coconut oil and ships it to us in 55 gallon drums. And if we can't get it from them, we're screwed. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a barrier, you know, a built in barrier to entry because nobody in their right mind would do what you're doing because <laughs> the stuff is so expensive. It's a premium product. But if you're the only show in town or in the country really doing it the right way, then it pays off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of our customers, they they appreciate what we're doing. And so they will pay for it. Our. um our, our market is still growing, right? It's still becoming. And a lot of the people that are like learning about vegan, plant-based and, you know, their health and stuff, you know, they don't have these deep pockets. They are trying to, you know, they're trying to dabble in a world that's very expensive. So for us, you know, getting our prices down and getting into that, those other venues of, you know, that customer base who, who also needs it, who also wants it, but can't afford it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've been on social media and we've known each other again for decades. And, and I, I watched your, your, uh, your Facebook uh, page and, and you, you, you'd show some of the, the latest creations. You, 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 you're very proud of it. And it, it was all very well uh, presented photographed and everything like that, but it was very obvious that you were enjoying what you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what happened was I found out uh, that you had um, got, you had gotten a, uh, uh, you would gotten connected with um, uh, O'Leary, Kevin O'Leary, who is Mr. Yeah. Wonderful on Shark Tank. Yes. And he gave you, he and his people gave you an endorsement. Could you go go through that a little bit? Yeah. You wanted to, because you were, you basically wanted to expand. You were at a point where you wanted to expand and raise some cash, right? Yes, exactly. We, we did very, very well with, um, you know, our website finally launched and we got, you know, online shipping has just been doing crazy. We reached the nation. Um, they reached out to us. Um, yes. I guess about two years ago, they, they reached out to us and I <laughs> didn't really, I didn't take it seriously at first. <laughs> I thought it was a phishing email. 
Um, and then a few months later, <laughs> they reached out again. And, and I said, I think this is a real thing. You know, they said, you know, we're doing crowdfunding. Um, it's, it's a new business that they've started called Start Engine. And um, it basically allows all of your own customers and other, you know, smaller entrepreneurs or small time investors to be their own shark, you know? So um, they asked us if we wanted to um, create a campaign and that they would host it on their platform, selling common stocks to, um, to everybody, you know, and they have a huge, huge investor list. So we um, worked with them for about six months, I guess, creating a campaign and an advertising platform and doing all the things to, um, to raise money. And we've always had the intention of more locations one way or the other, through a franchise, through you know, growth ourselves. Um, and that was our clear goal in going into the campaign was we wanted to have at least you know, two, three more stores open. And we had seen other vegan companies on their platform, which is why they reached out to us, do incredibly well, easily raising you know, $2 million. Um, so I had my, heights, my heart set, my, my eyes set on a good 900,000 so we could do a couple of stores. And after three months, which the campaign ran, like if you guys remember last year, this year, the middle of March to the end of June, which was like the worst time in the market, in the market <laughs> since like 2008. So nobody was investing. Um, everybody was just keeping things very close to their, their chest. We had spent a ton of money um, making videos, campaigning, you know, lots of ad money spent, um, lots of time going into creating the campaign. And we only raised $150,000, which out of that, I'd say we were able to actually keep 75,000. So, you know, Start Engine gets their bit, um, yeah. everybody gets it. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but they did help you structure the company in many respects. Yeah. yeah, huge good things came out of it. And I would do it again, actually. I would not say it was a negative. It was just one of those hard things. But huge things came out. One of them was we restructured from an LLC into an uh, incorporation. So that's a nice thing. Now we can sell stocks. That's always an option for us. Um, we have a board of directors now. We have a much more clear line on what we want to do with our business as a whole. And that was how we came to Capstone also was, you know, now we have some ideas of what we want to do when we have the money to do it. Um, and so Capstone, we thought, you know, franchising, expanding, definitely getting onto the East Coast. You know, almost half of our customers outside of California are from New York and they pay a lot in shipping. And yet they still, you know, yeah. still are top customers. <laughs> and they yeah, have let, options out there. Let, let me see. I'm going to see if I can transfer this and uh, show the video that you created. My heart ached for the little girl who lived next door to us who couldn't eat anything from the local bakery at her own birthday party. So I created a gluten-free plant-based brownie that was shockingly delicious. Suddenly, the whole neighborhood was begging for more and Karma Baker was born. Now that was really a, a great video and that came out of Start Engine. They basically told you you needed to do this, but they didn't really help you do it. You had to do it yourself, correct? Yes, yes, definitely. They are the, they're the money people, you know, they're not the marketing people. So they, they, you know, kept us online or on track as far as, you know, what needed to be in, in place to, um, you know, be compliant and everything. But when it came to creative and getting our message out there, um, that was, that was completely us. So we, we hired some people to help us make a video so that you know, we could get the word out the right way. But they also help you structure the company and the equity in the company and all of that business, correct? Yes. Yeah, so they manage all of the stocks that we have sold and they will continue to in, into the future. So um, we are now able to be, yeah, sell common stock. Um, it's managed for us and we have the ability to, you know, communicate with our um, investors and and keep on top of that. 
Yeah, um, you know, we have um, we we have a couple of uh, questions here. Um, how do you master um, the fears from the of the future and maintain an entrepreneurial spirit? I, I got this a couple of times. Basically, the same thing. You know, um, people are scared to open a vegan cafe because they're their thing, they're, they're, there's not that many vegans mm -hmm. in the US. Well, actually there are, and they're very committed and they're very, they're, they, it's almost, it's, like I said, it's almost like a cult. What is your attitude towards that? Um, and how do you find your customers? So basically the fear of actually starting a company, the fear of starting a vegan company, and how do you find your customers? Yeah, so it is, it is scary. You know, it is really scary to, to do anything. It's scary to do anything that you don't know the outcome on. But I mean, you don't know the outcome on anything. You know, when you marry someone, you don't know how it's going to go. You know, you hope for the best, but you really don't know. So, you know, trusting yourself in, in I guess trusting yourself when things are going to get hard, that not that you're going to know the answer, but that you're going to maintain your integrity in the moment to just keep on going and believe in yourself and what you're doing. Um, you know, as far as choosing a vegan company, I mean, that's, that was easy. You know, it, it, I, I wasn't worried about, you know, who's going to not take this, you know, like there, there's only so many people. Um, it's more like, you know, these are the people that need it. I'm providing something people need and want and will find me, you know, all I have to do is tell them I'm here and they will come, you know? So that was kind of how I've always sort of managed it. And I still, think that in the back of my mind when people find out about us they want it they're excited they're they're proactive in in coming to find the food you know um yeah there's been many many times yeah. in this road where where when something goes really scary or dark and i and i do find myself going is everything going to fall apart i i say how could i have done all of this every single day up to this point for it to just fall apart today. Like, no, it's not uh, how it's going to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dr. Johnson uh, from Westcliff uh, asked a question. Um, you know, there's, there's a bias against vegan food because it all tastes like crap. <laughs> I've tasted your stuff and it, uh, it tastes as good as, if not better than, than any other bakery. But how do you get over that? bias that people have i make really good food and i stuff it in their mouth you know that is <laughs> that's how it goes because like i said we had that from the very beginning everything i'd had that was vegan or gluten-free was horrible it was literally horrible like well you know and we're like eating it at my neighbor's house because she's baked this for her daughter and so the very fact that we made something so much better was my platform you know, for, for how do I, how do I fix this? You know, I have no trouble. I'm a hundred percent confident. If you eat this, you will like it. You know, uh -huh. I, just, I just know that. And everybody that works here, that's the goal every day. You know, they have one chance, they have one bite to change someone's mind. Because when, when someone does take a bite of our food, they, they do for a moment go, wait a minute, this doesn't have eggs or dairy. Like maybe you don't need it, you know, and that's the, that's really the thing we're after is awakening consciousness to a new way to think about your food, your body, the planet, the environment, you know, just so many things are going into that one bite and everybody here knows how important it is. Right. And, and you've, you've got a tremendous following nationally. I mean, you're shipping all over the country uh, significantly. And the interesting thing is that your sales in LA, which is where your corporate is, is the same as in Chicago and New York. Even though the shipping costs are pretty significant, yeah. which pretty much shows that these your 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 customer base is not price sensitive at all. Exactly, exactly. They are quality sensitive. They. They want something superior and they're willing to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and what we've done is we brought you into the Westcliff Capstone program because 
you have you have grown to the point where it's time to start thinking about expanding. And uh, originally, you were looking at possibly doing a franchise. Mm -hmm. And what happened was the capstone our capstone program. We have, I think, four or five uh, MBAs who are about to graduate plus faculty, and they they bring you in and they go through uh, a project, basically uh, a problem, and they help resolve that problem for you. And the problem was, how do we expand? Where do we expand? And what they did was they, they actually did a, a complete analysis of your sales across the country. And they determined where um, the best, the optimal um, storefronts would be, the optimal places for a factory, whatever. Um, let me uh, share once again. I want to show this first. This is something uh, that uh, I present at my workshop on the entrepreneurial mindset. Because again, after they, the students have seen uh, uh, Musk and, and Jobs and, and uh, Marty Cooper, what they've gone through and everything like that, I wanted to, again, bring them down to home, bring them home back down to earth and say, no, this is true for everybody. Everybody goes through the same thing. Hopefully the audio is working. Hi, my name is Celine Eichler. I am the owner, creator, and founder of Karma Baker, a vegan gluten-free bakery in Los Angeles. Um, I started in 2013 uh, with a cottage license out of my home, uh, selling to various cafes and um, restaurants. I knew that there was a need for a superior product out there. I had not tasted anything that was vegan and gluten-free, meaning no dairy, no eggs, no wheat, um, that was even palatable. Uh, so I spent five years creating a superior product, about five or six, and I started my small business. Um, so we found a kitchen with a storefront and um, I actually had intended to go more into the grocery store sector and do more wholesale, but then everybody in the neighborhood started knocking on the front door saying, when are you gonna open? And so Karma Baker became a storefront. The storefront definitely was a um, positive in the business, but it also was very fickle. And so we continued our reach into wholesale. Um, wholesale was always very costly and continued to do so. So for years we did that and then had to pretty much finish it off and not do it anymore because it was just costing us way too much money because our product is very high quality with very rare unsubsidized ingredients, which means that a normal cupcake is half the cost to create than ours. And so we can't give grocery stores and wholesalers the price point that they want in order to get the margin that they need. There were many, many mistakes like that along the road that you know you don't know that you're in it until you're in it. Um, and they cost us a lot of time, a lot of money, um, but also a lot of learning takes place in those arenas. Before opening the store, I spent five years in R&D which meant um, finding ingredients, learning about these in different ingredients. Um, our flours are not traditional. So it's not wheat flour, it's not cornmeal, it's not even cornstarch. It's things like um, arrowroot and tapioca, sorghum flour, brown and white rice, xanthan gum. So many different ingredients that are A, difficult to come by and also um, there isn't a lot of information about them. So definitely we had to do a lot of shelf life um, R&D, uh, freezer to fridge to, um, you know, maintain that quality of mouthfeel. You know, it's very, very important that not only is our, our, our cupcake or something really good right out of the oven, but it needs to sit for a few days. And what happens if we put it in the fridge or put it in the freezer? You know, we have such a high bar at creating a product. Uh, so R&D in, um, as many arenas as possible was crucial, time consuming, money consuming <laughs> as everything is. Um, but it definitely set the foundation for um, making a really superior product right out of the gate. Some of the struggles involved in these early days, especially, um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you aren't just a business owner. So a business owner is another aspect to this altogether. As a business owner, you are wearing 
10 different hats. You have to be good at every single type of job, be good at ordering it, good at sales, good at actually baking the product in my case, um, or manufacturing maybe in some other cases. Um, um, some of the hardest things is finding a really good team. Finding employees that care about your business the way you do is crucial and can take years. Um, it's not just about finding someone who is um, capable of you know doing whatever that job is they actually need to be your cheerleader they are an extension of you and finding other people that believe in you and want you to lead them is difficult even if you're super charismatic and you know have a lot of energy and are totally excited about what you're doing not everybody will get on along for the ride i used to work all the time and not just work like be at the office but thinking work wake up with the business go to sleep with the business dream about the business wake up with the business um, and i really had to start setting limits for myself so that i could manage um, the stress of having a business that's all consuming and also having a life where i can rejuvenate and relax because as the mother of a family or the captain of a ship, you need to be the healthiest, the strongest, the clearest thinker in order to lead all of the people that you're leading. In the last few years, we've really been focusing on um, expansion. It was almost like spending the last two years creating an entirely new business from scratch. <laughs> so it's been stressful. Uh, but it also really put us in the position that we want to be in for ultimate growth. So where we were um, doing about 40% wholesale, we now only do 10%. But we did revamp the entire business so that the rest of our business is coming from uh, online orders. So we have a whole new website, we ship to the entire US, um, and we extended our shipping catalog, which was only about five items, to about 80 now <laughs> it's um it, it's become a whole new business it's really the only way i can say it um it, with that growth we've realized we'd like to have more stores in order to make shipping more um affordable for people and uh keep our product fresher and more active get the word out to more people so we did a campaign with kevin o'leary from shark tank uh, his company start engine found us and wanted to do an investment crowdfunding campaign we were very excited about it. It took a lot to put the campaign together. And then right when we started, like two weeks in, um, the market crashed at the beginning of um, April and nobody was investing in anything. And so while we were looking for, you know, $900,000 to open a couple new stores, we only got $150,000. And unfortunately, the way things work, Start Engine gets their piece. Um, all of the filming, all of the advertising gets their piece and there is, you know, a little bit left to do a little bit more um, advertising and stuff like that. So a disappointment to say the least, but also another really good learning curve. We learned a lot about how to sell our business and what we really want to do with it in the future. And that is crucial. But that has brought us to working with the Westcliff Capstone Group. They are helping us uh, create a pitch deck for expansion, expanding two, into two stores and possible franchising options. So we are very excited for them to create a pitch deck for us so that we can pitch that to Tech Coast Angels in the very near future. We are very excited about the future of Karma Baker and its potential for growth. Uh, our team is super solid. Eric and I have been doing this for 10 years now and know how to um, pivot and roll with the punches of having a business like this. Uh, but we're very excited about the growth that is to come. And you know, the biggest thing I can say about being an entrepreneur and what I have learned is that this really does take a deep love and a deep commitment to what you are doing. We are called to this. You don't do this because you think it's a smart idea. <laughs> you do it because you have something in you that truly drives you forward and everything in your being wants to see this to fruition, wants to see it to the end, wants to create it to its fullest. Um, being an entrepreneur definitely means being nimble, being creative, um, and doing what it takes for your business to survive. I have zero doubt that Karma Baker will be on the tips of everyone's mouth in the near future. Good day to everyone. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, the kind of thing that, that the Capstone program did. This is a scattergram of all of your, your sales throughout the country. And you can see 
there, there's a, there's a, it's basically a heat map. You can see where the majority of your customers are, and those are the areas that you're focusing on actually building out uh, right now. And we're going a little bit further in terms of uh, uh, modeling various scenarios and that sort of thing. We've got, you know, uh, speaking about how many people are vegan, we've got a whole bunch of questions here from vegans. Um, as a matter of fact, well, one person says they're an ethical vegan, and you know, uh, the their their concern is that you you didn't mention very much about the compassion of animals, but I know that you and I have spoken, and that is a of, of significant concern to you, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Um, can you say it again? Their concern is what of animals? Compassion. Compassion, yes. Um, yeah. So my food allergies easily, quickly turned me vegan. Um, I actually noticed that there was a, a, a change in me, deep in me, where um, even though I quit, I quit eating all red meat and, and dairy and eggs, I it almost immediately couldn't look at meat. I didn't want to eat meat. I all of a sudden meat became an animal. Like I had a huge, huge change, you know, and this was in 2010 um, when I, you know, found out about my allergies. Um, so it, being vegan is is our platform. I mean, that is the consciousness that we are changing for people. You know, anybody who eats our food, we consider, um, you know, having a vegan moment. You know, it's it's the animal plight is to our core personally here huge, but not everybody is able to hear that message. So we promote ourselves as totally vegan company. We don't use any animal products in anything. We don't use gelatin. We don't use um, you know, ground up red bugs in our food coloring. <laughs> you know, we don't use any of those, no honey. You know. um, but we also know that we're reaching a larger group of people than just vegans. And the most important thing is converting those people as a potential vegan. You know, Every time they, they eat our food and they don't they, they realize it doesn't have dairy and eggs, you know, they have the opportunity to go, you know, maybe I don't need it in my coffee anymore. Maybe I don't need it in my, my salsa or, you know, whatever their, their sour cream, you know, like there's, there's a, a window that the, we've opened and whether it changes someone to be hundred percent vegan or not, I don't know, but I do know that we as a business and I, as a person have affected change and have saved animals lives. And that's, what matters to me. <laughs> uh, are the, is the product keto? Um, we don't, it's not really keto. Keto would be like zero carb, but we right. have, um, our flour does have carbohydrates in it. And how, will, how can people know that it's genuine? That's the question. Uh, that, that what is genuine? That, that it's genuine vegan, 100%. Well, we state it many times on our website. We are 100% dedicated, meaning we don't allow any, any products that we use, you know, to have, you know, traces of milk, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we are a vegan company. Yeah. There's one person here who uh, wants to know if you're interested in international expansion. They've got uh, connections uh, just about everywhere. Um, I, I think this is a very, very hot topic. I think it's a very hot product. I think you've, you've, you've nailed a, a niche that could expand beyond the, uh, the demographic, the, the key demographic, uh, because it does taste so good. I mean, it, it, it tastes as good as, as, as any bakery product. As I said, you, you could never tell that it was, uh, it was uh, vegan. You certainly can't. Um, well, thank you. You know, what kind of obstacles do you face when, uh, well, you already said that, but going forward, uh, what obstacles do you have and, and what do you plan, how are you planning on marketing this to a broader audience? Mm. Um, definitely some obstacles right now are, you know, the, the current economic vibration, which is, you know, all food costs are going up, all employee costs, labor's all at an all time high and an, an all time hard to find, you know, finding good people is, is really hard. Every, everybody has kind of had a turn of, a, a turn of self where they are rethinking that they don't want to have a job <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, I'd, I'd say between the labor and the ingredients, things are, are hard right now. Um, so hard right now, actually. But we also know that we always, you know, we march through these hard things like mud and we get to the other side and we're walking fine again. So we will pivot and turn and figure out how to, you know, deal with our ingredient issues and employee issues. Um, marketing wise, you know, we, we market mostly to people with food um, preferences, whether it's, you know, uh, lifestyle preferences, environmental, you've chosen to be vegan, um, you, you have to be because you have no choice, you have food allergies, you're celiac, you know, uh, we market to those people right now, like, hey, we're here, because we're still in that, like, hey, we're here stage. Um, you know, we need to, we need to reach a million people. And I don't think we do that. So um, I want to market to everybody. I want everybody to reconsider their food. And, you know, dessert is usually a gateway to um, other things. Well, the remarkable thing is this map we're looking at right now, this is pretty much word of mouth, isn't it? Yeah, I love this map. Yeah, this, um, I would say social media has been great for us. It's been a great way for me to reach the country um, as well as yes, foreign countries and we would love to be in them. Um, England also like they're, they get vegan. They are good at it. They get it. You can go into any pub and get a vegan meat pie. You know, it's, it's much more open there. There's much more acceptance and because it's a health country, you know, they take care of their own health and they're supporting vegan as a country. Um, it's not a fad there. It's yeah, yeah. In the so, UK, yeah, there, there's a lot of jokes about the taste of food over in the UK. So <laughs> anything is good. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. But any, anyway, uh, so you know, going on to Capstone, we 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 yeah. located places in Chicago, also in New York. I mean, down to the street and borough level. We that's, that they really did. They really went overboard and. Uh, Found new locations that you can you can expand into. Um, Slate, I really want to thank you for spending this time with us. This was fascinating. Um, uh, you know, I, I have no equity or financial interest in your company. I just have an interest in you and the company succeeding. And and uh, uh, I, I just think it's a great story and it's a great case study for students, uh, MBA students. Frankly, thank you. Uh, let me uh, let me just uh, just mention briefly that uh, we're planning on having a uh, uh, an international food and culture festival Thursday December eighth. We've got 120 different countries that are, are represented here at Westlip. We have a huge international population, and we want to celebrate that those the the diversity of our cultures. And this is one way that we can do this. And I hope everybody can. Uh, can make it on December 8th, Thursday, uh, on campus. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, again, uh, Celine, I want to thank you for spending this time. The name of the company is Karma Baker, and I think it's karmabaker.com. Yep. Correct? Yes. So you can look it up, and uh, they're just in, uh, where? In Woodland. Woodland. We're in West Lake Village. Westlake Village. Outside of Los Angeles, yeah. Yeah, so go in there and, and give it a try. She's got a, she's got a bakery storefront right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come on by or order something online. We ship two day and overnight. Great. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it.